Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. This is week four and lecture three. We'll be talking about the quantitative aspects of retention time. This is part of our treatment of the basic theory of chromatography. And my goal for this particular mini lecture is to make sure you understand what a partition coefficient is and how you can use partition coefficients to understand how much time something spends in a column. I'll also be introducing you to the terminology related to capacity factors. So we need to start thinking about partitioning. And partition is kind of an intuitive word. It means if you have 100 molecules of, let's say, benzene, and you've got two different solvents, how many go into, let's say, the more polar solvent, and how many go into the nonpolar solvent? Partition tells you the concentration difference as a solute partitions among two different liquid phases. And so it's very simply defined as a concentration of the solute in phase one liquid phase divided by its concentration in another. So something like benzene is going to completely go into hexane and probably not go into water at all. But sometimes you can have solvents that have more moderate, kind of in, in the middle polarities, or molecules within the middle polarities. And in fact, most of the molecules fall in that gray area. And they kind of, you know, sometimes they'll go a little bit in the more polar, sometimes. And, and so K is not always a million or like 0. .00001. Often the partition coefficient really reflects subtleties about the solubility of the molecules in two different phases. So a couple of things about it when you kind of look at the how you define concentration. So it's definitely about how many moles go into one phase over another. So let's say you were doing an extraction with an ether and, I don't know, water, and you had some organic molecule. Well, it's probably going to want to go into the ether, but some will still stay behind in the water. But let's say you don't want any behind in the water. Well, you can make the volume of the water or of the ether very, very large. And in effect, the partition will force more molecules up into the big phase because remember, it's trying to keep concentration the same. So if you have a really big volume of one phase and a little tiny volume of the other phase, even if the partition coefficient seems about equal or not equal, it's going to drive the moles into the larger volume phase. So there's two factors I guess I'm trying to get you to realize in partition coefficient. One is if you have equal volumes, 50 mils of one and 50 mils of the other, where the moles go. Because in that case, the volume cancels out and it really is a molar ratio. But you can also realize that where the moles goes depends a lot on the volume. And you can drive material into one phase over another by just having a very, very large volume of that phase. So both volume and partition and the moles and which phase they go into are all interrelated through something we call K. Now in the rest of this lecture, and I want you to make a note of this, I'm going to be using the terminology K with a bar over the top. That's mainly because we need to distinguish it from the term for capacity factor, which is a little K. So I usually use K bar in future lectures. Just to give you an idea of what partition coefficients look like, a really common partition coefficient that you can find in tables is the octanol water coefficient. It's called the KOW. And it's kind of a rule of thumb about, sort of about polarity. Remember, octanol is a, an eight chain alcohol. So it's got some polarity, but it's also got a lot of hydrophobicity. And you're putting it up against water. So if you look at this table, the material up here, butanone and aniline, these are relatively polar. Now, again, if you had a lot, lot more octanol, you would drive more moles into that. Okay, so if you go down to DDT, you see something very different. You would find that if you had one million molecules of DDT, only one might get into the water. And so really, you see a huge range of partition coefficients, and they more or less reflect basic concepts of polarity. And there's some subtler issues in there, but for now, we're just going to be thinking of it as polar things go into polar solvents. So let's try to use those partition coefficients because it does have a definition associated with it. So let's say I want to know, going back to our chromatography column, how much of the material is in the stationary phase at any given time. So we need to abstract that sort of picture I gave you of the Gaussian distribution of concentration of the analyte and then a little bit of it leaking into the column into sort of, okay, it's volume A, volume B. So that's what I've done here. 
And then I know that my partition is just the ratio of the concentrations, which is shown over here to the right. And what the problem tells me is that my mobile phase volume is 100 times more that of my stationary phase. So that means the ratio VM over VS is just 100, and whatever the volumes are, cancel. So really what this is asking us to find is MS, the moles in the stationary phase, divided by total moles, as shown here. So what I did is I reduced that expression by dividing by M sub S on both the top and the bottom of that equation, and I ended up with M sub M over M sub S, which if you look up here, you can relate it to the partition coefficient pretty easily by just rearranging K bar, and you can basically see that V sub M over K bar V sub S is the same as M sub M over M sub S. Putting all that together, I calculated the fraction of material in this case to be 2.9% in the stationary phase. So what do these trends look like over wider ranges? I did some Excel charting just to give you a sense of what things look like. So what I've done in this case is I've asked the question here in the middle part, this is the fraction of the material that would be in the stationary phase. And I've looked at a wide range of partition coefficients. So up at partition coefficient of 10, for equal volumes, you'd have 10 more moles in the stationary phase than in the mobile phase. But you certainly don't have that here because, of course, you have um, far more volume in the mobile phase than in the stationary phase. And you'll notice as I go from 100 times more volume in the mobile phase to 1,000, I really drop significantly the fraction of material that is going to be in the stationary phase. The other trend you'll notice is as the partition gets smaller, as my partition into the stationary phase, and by the way, partition into the stationary phase always means the stationary phase concentration is on the top. What you can see is that as I drop my partition coefficient, not surprisingly, I drop the fraction of total material that's present in the stationary phase. So I wanted you just to see the huge importance of the volume difference between the mobile and the stationary phase, and also how sensitive these things are to the partition coefficients. The important take home, volume is everything. While I drew the picture over on the left, is when I was trying to explain it to you, realize that in most chromatography systems, the mobile phase volume will be vastly in excess of the stationary phase volume. So even if the partition coefficient says, hey, it might want to spend some time there, it's going to be really hard because of the full volume of mobile phase that needs to be filled up in order to kind of counterbalance and keep that partition coefficient happy. So I want to drill down and make really sure you see a derivation about how the partition coefficient, big K bar, relates to the retention time. It's actually a very quantitative relationship. And oftentimes, companies actually publish partition coefficients in for their column with really common um, mobile phases. And that can be very useful because you might be able to actually figure out a retention time from that. Where it's really become important is in proteomics, which is an application of liquid chromatography to the analysis of proteins. And to do that, you actually get a lot of small fragments of proteins or peptides out of the chromatography system. And if you could identify the peptides based on their retention time, that would be phenomenal. So there's really become a lot of interest recently in this biological application for predicting retention times based on these kinds of So the first thing we're going to do is realize that the fraction of time an analyte spends in the mobile phase is equal to T sub R times basically the fraction of time it's spent in the mobile phase. And so if it spent 30% of the time in the mobile phase, then the mobile phase time is 30% of T sub R. Okay, so if you brought that, then what we're going to do is just substitute the fraction of time the analyte spends in the mobile phase, which is M sub M over M total. So the fraction of time it spends there is proportional to the molar fraction. Now we're going to take that M sub M over M total and see if we can relate that fractional, the fact that there's 30% of the total moles of M is in the stationary phase at any given time, to the partition coefficient. We're going to do that simply by taking this expression, dividing the top and bottom by M sub M, and we're going to be left with this M sub S over M sub M. But remember, what I just arrived for you before was that that ratio is equal to the partition coefficient times the ratio of the stationary, vo stationary volume over the mobile phase volume. So you can simply substitute that particular term in, and you end up with this expression, which relates the T sub M to T sub R. And this is very important, because if you know T sub M, which you almost always do, and you know K, big K, and Vs and Vm, you can actually 
estimate, maybe even predict your retention times. So big K is this parameter you can look up. And so for that reason, it can be a powerful way to interpret and understand retention time. One last term I need to define for you is capacity factor. So we've talked a lot about retention time and sort of the dead phase time, but capacity factor, or little k, has a whole other definition. It's the difference between the retention time and the mobile phase time. So it's basically the time you spend in the stationary phase divided by T sub m. So it's kind of a weighted number of uh, you know, if it took two minutes to get through the column, how many two-minute units did you spend hanging out in the stationary phase? You can turn and relate the capacity factor quite nicely to big K through this analysis shown here. You can take a look at that expression if you want. And in the end, little k and big K are very nicely related. So capacity factors are really nice numbers to work with. One of the challenges then you might think about is what if a capacity factor is really big, like 50? Well, that means it took 50 of the mobile phase units <laughs> to move through the column. And why that's bad is that it could just take a really long time to do the analysis. You might be there for 50 hours, which you might not want to be. And as you're going to see later in resolution, that can actually cost you in terms of resolution. So you don't want capacity factors to be really big. But on the other hand, if the capacity factor is 1, meaning the substance of interest moved through the column about as fast as the mobile phase did, you often have a very difficult time distinguishing it from the mobile phase and really getting a good read, especially if you're doing a quantitative analysis. So typically, you want to have materials that have capacity factors between about 1.5 and 50. So I'm going to stop right now, and you can take a break, and then come back, and the next lecture is going to be a bunch of examples where we work through some of those quantitative principles.